have to remember about the inauguration of a president then in comparison to today was there was a lot less security, okay? There's a lot less protection of the president. Matter of fact, total protection of the president really didn't happen until after John F. Kennedy was assassinated clear into 1963. So the Secret Service as we know it today and presidential protection as we know it today wasn't even a thought back in those days. So on March 4th, 1829, on March 4th, 1829, when Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as the nation's seventh president, all the common people from all over the country could come and watch that. Okay, and you can watch a presidential inauguration now, but you're kind of limited and you got to go through screening and there's lots of things uh, as far as that goes. So everything was accessible back on March 4th, 1829, when President Andrew Jackson was inaugurated. And people all over, common people, were so jubilant over Jackson's victory. They believed that the average person was going to get a fair shake at government, and the nation's capital was jammed with over 10,000 visitors during uh, Jackson's inauguration. And most of those 10,000 people were from where? Frontier. Matter of fact, many of them traveled as far away as 500 miles to come see the inauguration. And 500 miles then was a lot different than 500 miles now. 500 miles now would probably take you about eight hours to get here by car, or if you flew, it might take you less than an hour. But back in those days, when you came horseback and carriage and everything else, that was a journey to come 500 miles. So they estimated that on March 4, 1829, when Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as the nation's seventh president, that there were about 10,000 visitors, mostly the common man, who traveled from as far as nearly 500 miles away to see Jackson sworn in. Okay, it was a pretty, pretty big crowd for him. What's that? But no, 10,000 visitors traveled some as far away as 500 miles. I thought in the video it said 15. 15 miles? No, 15,000. Well, there might have been 10 to the who, I mean, I don't think they had an actual count. Could be probably 10 to 15. We'll go with 10,000 now, between 10 and 15, if that's what you'd like. Now, this would never happen today, but after the inauguration, President Jackson held an open house at the White House. Anybody that wanted to come and help celebrate his inauguration could come and do that. And a lot of the common people who hadn't seen anything like that jammed into the executive mansion, that's what they call it, to greet him, and most were not very social, socially graceful. I'm pretty sure that's the part where they start freaking out. They said yeah. they went to go celebrate at the house. Could have, yeah. There's just a lot. Between ten and 15,000 people came in. I mean, a bunch of them came to this open house at the White House. And they weren't the most socially graced people. And things got a little bit out of control. I'll give you uh, four examples of how things kind of got out of control during this open house after the inauguration. Well, people were climbing on chairs and tables, didn't have the social graces they needed. That's one example. And a lot of them had muddy, muddy boots on. So if you can imagine people inside the White House during this reception, during this open house, and they're climbing up on the furniture, on the chairs and tables, and they have muddy boots on. I mean, that was not exactly what you would maybe see, deem to be presidential, you know what I mean? So there's one example of how things got out of control. Men in muddy boots climbed on tops of chairs and tables. Another example of how things got out of control during this open house the White House is a lot of furniture in the White House was broken and destroyed. A lot of the furniture in the White House was either broken or destroyed. Okay, a lot of the furniture in the White House, what's that? So he threw a massive house for him? Well, basically, yeah, he did. They've supplied, third example is they supplied trays of food. And, you know, for those people who came to the White House, they were knocked over and there was just a huge mess all over the White House of food that had been knocked off the tables or whatever. Things got kind of crazy and I guess in the terms of Say Larkin's this house party at the White House got a little crazy. Now, what happens when you go sometimes to these house parties and people bump into each other, knock over trays? What fights. results? Fights. fights. Yeah, there were fights that broke off out all over the White House too. I mean, this thing got just kind of crazy. Like I mentioned, men in muddy boots climbed on chairs and tables. Furniture was broken in the White House. 
trays of food were knocked all over, making a huge mess, and fights eventually broke out all over the White House and the surrounding area, the grounds. Well, things got so crazy that they had to escort President Jackson out of the White House and take him to his local hotel room to avoid any injury. Now, it wasn't anybody who tried to injure him on purpose, but it just got a little crazy. But he wanted to shake his hand and pat him on the back and all these types of things. And there were just simply too many people there and things were getting too out of hand. So they escorted Jackson right out of the White House and got him to a hotel room so he could avoid any injury. Now, the people that were not common people, the people that were critical or Republicans, witnessed this open house and they wondered, what the world, have we lost our minds? Have we lost all sense of law and order? Has King mob taking over our country now that this quote hillbilly president is now in office these common people with no manners or social graces they're he, they basically the wealthy referred to those people as king mob and wondered if we were going to lose all of our law and order in the united states now that this backwoodsman from tennessee was occupying the white house so a lot of wealthy republicans wondered if king mob or this crazy group of, of uh, common people who are now going to be uh, losing our law and order within the United States. So it was kind of a, a not very presidential performance by Jackson's supporters. Okay? Now we're going to talk about Jackson's philosophy of government, which historians refer to as the spoils system of government. So we're going to talk about the spoils system of government. First of all, we need to know what Jackson really believed in. What were his firm convictions as he took over the presidency? What did he believe politically? Okay? And I'm going to give you three firm convictions that President Jackson had, things that he believed in concerning government, and see if you think they match up with today. First of all, this was kind of a new one. He believed the government belonged to all the people who could vote wasn't just for the rich or the wealthy or the influential. He believed that the government belonged to all people that could vote. Now, fortunately for him, 90% of the people that could vote were common people. But that doesn't mean he didn't believe that wealthy Easterners shouldn't have say. He just thought they should have equal say to that of the common person. So he believed, number one, that the government of the United States belonged to all of the people who had the right to vote. Did he think women had any uh, say in the government? No, because they did not have the right to vote. Okay. He also believed, interestingly enough, in limited federal government. He believed in limited federal government, and the same token, which means he believed in what? State Strong state government. Okay, so he believed in limited federal government, that the states should have the power kind of to say what happens in their states. Which is kind of an oxymoron when you think about his third philosophy of government because he believed very strongly in the power of the presidency. He believed very strongly in the power of the presidency. So he believes the government belongs to all people who can vote, but he also believes in a limited federal government, which means he believes in strong state governments, right? He thinks the states ought to make the rules for their own sake. But he believes in the power of the presidency, which tells you what? It's okay to make the rules you want to make until he disagrees, and then who gets to decide? Not Congress so much, but him. He believed in the power of of the presidency. He didn't give a rat's fanny about Congress, to be honest with you. He believed that the state should be able to make up their own laws, that we have a limited federal government. You have to have some federal government, but a limited federal government, strong state government, but he believed in the power of the presidency. Now, one of the first things he did when he took office was to create this spoils system of government. He was the first to create what we know as the spoils system of government. Anybody know what that is? The spoils system of, any, of government? 
Or you could have the spoil system of administration here. Or you could have the spoil system of me picking my classes here, if I had that choice. What is it? Basically, favoritism. What's that? Go ahead. You're close. Favoritism? Oh, like. Why would you favor these people? You're getting close. Because they voted for you and they supported you. So they are what to you? The L word. They voted for you. They love you. They think you're awesome. They're very loyal to you. So what he did is he took all of his political opponents out of the government around the presidency and he replaced them with people that were loyal to it. Okay? So, the system of government where you replace all of your political opponents in office with those that you consider your supporters is the spoil system of government. Is that a good system of government? First of all, let's talk about this. You know where the spoil system, that name came from? You ever heard this expression? I'll guarantee you if you watch, I heard it at the end of the World Series this year. You'll hear it at the end of the Super Bowl. Somebody will say it when they present the trophy. They'll say, to the victor belong the spoils. You'll hear that. I'll guarantee you, every time you watch something where they win a championship, the announcer will get up there and then they give the trophy and they'll say, to the victor belong the spoils. That means the person that wins gets to make the rules. Okay, who won? Jackson. Who wins the Super Bowl gets to make you know, the kind of the rules of what football. You're the best football team in the world, so you're now, everybody should be looking at you as how to build a football team. To the victor belong the spoils. If you look up at the t-shirt that my seniors make, they put on the back of their t-shirt for some reason because it hit them, to the seniors belong the spoils. That's what they put on their shirt. They have to, they choose whatever they want to put on their shirts. This year they put to the seniors belong the spoils. In other words, they're victorious, they're seniors, they're the example. Well, what would be the good well, this would certainly encourage loyalty, wouldn't it, Shayla? I mean, it would encourage loyalty. Boy, if you're loyal to Andrew Jackson, you might get in his cabinet or you might be put in some special positions. What's the detriment of the spoil system of government? Why is it not so many goods? Put all these loyal people in key positions in the federal government. Why could that be bad? Well, that's a good point. They all might have the same thoughts, and if their thoughts are bad, they're bad. That's a good point. Um, no, no, you might get some. Think about it. I was just going to say, if like, he doesn't have an idea, they all say he doesn't have an idea. That's right. That's exactly right. That's another reason. So, first of all, you said again, if they come up with a bad idea, no one's going to argue against it. You're saying what? If the president comes up with a bad idea, nobody's going to stay up and say, now that's a bad idea because they don't want him to be mad at him. So what it does is it weakens your government because you don't necessarily put people in key positions that have any political experience. You're simply putting your buddies in there, right? Your buddies in there. So for example, if Mr. Sanford takes over the principalship, this is just a scenario, and one of his friends that he really likes wants to be the assistant principal at Warland, and he's good buddies with him, and he knows that the guy will be loyal, one of his friends he's known for 30 years, and he hires the guy, but the guy is awful at being, he was a bad teacher, he's just, you know, he does, he just is lazy, but he's friends of him. If he brings him in as assistant principal, is that going to make this school better? No. And if Mr. Sanford decides that he's going to uh, suspend everybody out of school for 20 days if they get caught with a cell phone the first time, if the good assistant principal would say to the principal, God, I don't know, that's a very good idea, that's pretty harsh. You know, but who would, if you were a supporter, what would you say if he came up with that role? Oh, yeah. great idea, buddy. And the problem would be that you wouldn't have any kids in school because they'd all be on suspension for 20 days because they had the cell phone. I mean, that's a scenario. So the spoil system of government's really good for the person up top that thinks, boy, everybody thinks I'm neat. But it doesn't help your government unless those loyal people are very experienced. And most often, would they be? No, they really would not. Okay? So, as a result, these appointees that Jackson put forth did not make decisions best based on what was best for the country, okay? And President Jackson really believed that the spoil system of government helped the government. In reality, it's going to cause a ton of problems for his administration, okay? But he was a man that first 
started what we know today as the spoils system of government. To the victor belong the spoils. You win the presidency, you can do whatever you please. Okay, and everybody needs to agree with it. And I'm going to surround myself with all my political loyal buddies so that I have nobody to challenge any decision or anything I want to do. Okay? Now, probably one decision that Jackson made that nobody opposed that was a bad one was our next subtopic, which is President Jackson's Indian policy. And we can say Indian because that was the proper thing to say at that time. Okay? President Jackson's Indian policy. Now, let's think about this a minute. Cassie, what does President Jackson believe the Indian people are at this time? What's he think they are? Okay. He views them as what type of people? What do you view, what do you call people that aren't up to date? Close, prehistoric's close. Primitive. He, re, he really saw Indians as primitive people. Not up to snuff, didn't know what was going on. Technologically, even back in those days, they were way behind him. I mean, we're trying to build railroads and send up and put up telegraph to send information later in history and they're throwing up smoke signals, right? Am I right? So they're behind the times and he saw Indians as very primitive. And he really didn't, he really wanted to see every Indian that lived east of the Mississippi, he wanted to see them living west of the Mississippi. They'd be, they'd be kind of out of our way. Because even though we own this area and a lot of these people, a lot of these uh, areas that become territories like the Missouri Territory and the Oklahoma Territory and all that. What Jackson really wanted to see was all these Indians, and where'd most of them live? In this area, right? Southeastern part. He wanted to see them all living over here. He didn't really want them in the eastern part of the country. So he strongly believed that Indian tribes living east of the Mississippi River would be happier, and he thought they'd be better off if they lived in lands west of the Mississippi River. Okay? And he really believed this. He thought, well, if we move all these people west of the Mississippi, they might be able to keep their own way of life, or they might gradually accept the practices of the white man. Because we were continually trying to get these people to, that were Indians to be white. And their cultures didn't want it, didn't lead to that. Now, did we talked before, did a lot of these, for example, Creek Indians, did they decide finally to adapt the white man's ways? And the ones that didn't, became radical and were called the Red Sticks, and then we put them down militarily, right? Well, there's all kinds of Indian tribes still in this area here, and Jackson thinks they need to go west of the Mississippi, and he thinks, first of all, they'll be happier. He thinks it'll be better for the country. He thinks they might be able to move over west of the Mississippi if they want to continue their own ways of life or their own culture, they could, or they might gradually decide to accept the white man ways. But we don't really have to worry about them because they're over there. Right? They're over on the west side. Okay? So, because of his philosophy, he convinces Congress to pass a law called the Indian Resettlement Act of 1830, which is on your ID sheet. So with the philosophy in mind that Indians would be better west of the Mississippi, President Jackson convinces Congress to pass a law called the Indian Resettlement Act of 1830. What did this do? It provided for the removal of all Indians east of the Mississippi to where? Lands west of the Mississippi. So what the Indian Resettlement Act of 1830 stated is that all Indians and Indian tribes that lived east of the Mississippi would be moved west of the Mississippi. What did they call, what did Congress call these lands after they made this law? Indian Territory. So basically the Indian Resettlement Act of 1830 stated that all Indians and Indian tribes that were living east of the Mississippi would be moved into Indian Territory west of the Mississippi to live the way they wanted or change the white man's way, whatever they felt like doing. That was what the law stated. Now before this was even passed, many of the Indian tribes in the uh, southeastern part of the United States had already adopted the white man's way of life. Okay, a lot of them had done that. And I'm going to list five Indian tribes 
that many of their people already accepted the white man's way of life. And these five tribes are going to be known in history as what? The five civilized tribes. We've talked about it. The Creek, the Choctaw, whoops, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Florida, some so Seminole. Yep. Now, these five tribes became known in American history as the five civilized tribes. Now, when was this Removal Act passed? 1830. By 1833, three of these five Indian tribes had agreed to the removal and signed removal treaties. Now, if you sign a removal treaty, you're going to be treated differently than if you don't. Okay? So, the three tribes... By the end of 1833, that agreed to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, signed these removal treaties with the government for the Creek, the Choctaws, and the Chickasaw. Now, if you sign a removal treaty with the government, you would be relocated from your lands east of the Mississippi into Indian territory, lands west of the Mississippi, and you would be removed with...